Hey everybody, hope you all are doing well and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to join us. Uh, I'm Christine Maitland from the marketing team here at Azuka. We are very excited to welcome Matt Camden from Virginia Tech Transportation Institute and John Sims from Satellites Unlimited as today's presenters. Uh, Mr. Camden is a research associate in the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute Center for Truck and Bus Safety. Uh, he has 11 years of experience in the design and evaluation of transportation safety programs. Uh, Mr. Camden specializes in occupational driver safety uh, with a focus on programs and technologies to improve driver performance, <clears throat> management systems, uh, vehicle safety systems, safety culture, and driver distraction and fatigue. Uh, Mr. Camden will be talking about why technology alone is insufficient to alter driver behavior. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please utilize the question button on your right-hand side of the meeting window to send John any Grayson questions or anything you're curious about. We will be answering your questions at the end. All right, thanks, Christine. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today John with the opportunity to the share meeting. some of our work that we've done has at the Virginia the Tech Transportation Institute. Uh, just before we start, I just want to know if everyone can see the screen. Uh, If you can't, uh, please let us know on John the chat Wilson. box so we can uh, work on that. All right, thanks, Christine. So I'd like to start off the presentation with one of my favorite quotes regarding safety and driving related to onboard safety monitoring systems. So this quote comes from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And in 1951, their motto was, don't learn safety by accident. And this just really drives home the, the purpose of onboard driver safety monitoring programs. You don't want to learn how to do something safe only after a crash occurs. At that point, the damage has already been done. Um, you've already wrecked your vehicle. You've already potentially wrecked another person's vehicle. Somebody may have been injured and even worse, somebody may have been killed. It's much, much better if you can learn as an organization and for your drivers to learn how to be safe before that crash occurs so that you can prevent it from actually occurring in the first place and hopefully prevent any possible injuries or hopefully save a life in the future. Ganesh Babalal has joined the meeting. So my hope after Dave this presentation Ferguson. is that you has will know why driver monitoring systems sure. are important, has if driver the monitoring systems are effective at reducing risky driving behaviors and improving your fleet safety, and what you should do as an organization when you're considering to implement a driver monitoring program. So as you know, vehicle crashes pose a significant risk, an especially big risk for people who drive as part of their job. Andrew has joined in the meeting. In 2013, there were over 1,600 people killed and close to 300,000 people injured in a work-related crash. And since 2013, if we're counting uh, and, and taking into consideration the national trends, these numbers are only higher now than they were in 2013. In addition to all these injury and fatal crashes, over 700,000 crashes uh, occurred in a work-related crash that didn't has result the in injury or a fatality. Uh, but they did result in some sort of property damage, whether that was to your vehicle or a, another person's vehicle or to a structure. And it's estimated that all of these crashes, whether they're property damage, injury, or fatal crashes, cost employers approximately $25 billion in the United States alone. So obviously crashes are a major concern for employers. And when employers are, are trying to reduce their risk, looking at crashes should be the most valued and one of the most important things that is considered. But what actually causes Red, crashes? 
So I'll research the over the years, ever since the 1970s, has consistently shown that driver errors and risky driving behaviors are the contributing factors in almost 90% of all vehicle crashes. Uh, and these the driving errors could include decision errors, so a driver deciding potentially to um, drive too fast for, for the conditions or following too close to another vehicle um, or just driving aggressively. And they could also be recognition errors. So these are when the driver may be distracted by some sort of device or the radio inside the vehicle, or it could be external distraction. So the, the driver is distracted by something outside the vehicle. It could also be the driver misjudging the gap between their vehicle and another vehicle, or even falsely assuming what another driver is going to be doing on the roadway. Uh, another type of error is a performance error. These are when drivers have poor directional control or possibly overcompensate when they're performing an evasive maneuver to avoid another um, incident. And then finally, they could be non-performance errors. So this is when a driver may fall asleep behind the wheel or potentially when a, the driver has a medical emergency while driving. Has joined the meeting. Uh, uh, can somebody from Azuga advance the slide, please? So obviously drivers are doing things that increase their chances of being involved in a crash. So what can you do as, as an organization, as a fleet, to do to reduce that crash risk and to improve your fleet, fleet safety? So many fleets measure their safety only by looking at the number of crashes they have in a given year or a given week or a month. But these types of measures, only using the overall number of crashes, really doesn't tell you the total risk you have as a carrier when you go out on the road. And more importantly, it's not telling you why or the story of why those crashes are actually taking place. Um, because you've got to know why the crashes are happening if you want to try to prevent them from occurring again. So if we think of an iceberg where the majority of the iceberg is hidden below the water, so the majority of the risk associated with that iceberg is hidden, you can't see it. And only a very small percentage of the risk you can actually see above the water. Crashes and your crash risk as a fleet is exactly the same way. Typically, you would only see those very serious crashes, those crashes that are involved in a, a fatality or result in a serious injury, and potentially even the property damage crashes. Um, but if you're only looking and measuring your risk on those things you can see, you're not really getting your full picture or fully assessing the risk of your, of your organization. You're missing out on all those very minor property damage only crashes that may just be a ding to your vehicle or to another vehicle. Um, and you're definitely missing out on those near miss crashes. So maybe a crash actually didn't happen, but it was very close. And if the driver hadn't perform an evasive mover at the last second, the crash actually would have occurred. And more importantly, you're missing out on the at-risk driver behavior. So to get an accurate representation of your risk and then to reduce your risk, it's best to focus here at the bottom, the at-risk driving behavior. And if we can reduce the number of risky driving behaviors, we can reduce the number of near misses. We can reduce the number of minor crashes. And more importantly, we can reduce those serious injury and fatal crashes. So one way to measure risky driving behavior is through the use of an onboard monitoring system. Monitoring systems are typically technologies that are capable of providing objective measures of driving behavior through the use of either cameras or telematic sensors. Um, they can provide continuous measures of behavior anytime the vehicle is turned on. And the data that they provide can be used for corrective feedback to help drivers become better. And they can also help carriers identify which of their drivers are the most risky. But really, the technology alone is insufficient to alter behavior, especially if we're talking about lasting behavior change. Um, typically, they're not just a magic bullet that a carrier can, can install to eliminate all their risky behaviors and all their crashes. The technologies really should be considered just one tool of many that you have at your disposal or in your toolbox that you should use to improve safety. And what has been found to be the most impactful is by combining the, the onboard monitoring systems with behavioral safety techniques such as feedback, 
um, training and education and rewards and reinforcement for good driving are the most powerful that carriers can use to improve their safety records. So how can driver monitoring systems be combined with behavior change strategies to improve driving? So one way is to create driver safety scores or driver safety scorecards based on their risky driving behaviors such as hard braking or speeding, um, hard cornering, being distracted, or their seatbelt use. So the driver scores can then show the, the drivers how their driving safety is trending over time. Are they getting better over time? Or are they actually getting worse? Or are they not changing? And also the driver scores can be used to show drivers how they're driving safety-wise compared to all the other drivers within their fleet. But really for driver safety scores to be impactful, they have to be real and they have to be based on real events. Um, or in other words, real crash data. So just for an example, Azuga has found that, that their driver scores are actually strong predictors of a crash. So for example, um, any a one point increase in the hard braking score has been found to be associated with a reduced crash risk by 6.1%. So the drivers will actually know that this score is meaningful. If I get an increase in my score, it actually means that my crash risk is really being reduced. And vice versa, if their, their score is decreasing, they know that their actual crash risk is being increased. So they're more risky for, for being involved in a crash. So the power of combining these behavioral strategies with monitoring systems can also be seen in some of Azuga's results with their uh, in-vehicle buzzer system. So they've compared uh, drivers that are in vehicles with the buzzer to drivers in vehicles without the buzzer. And what they found was that idling, so not necessarily safety, but idling, has been reduced by 63% by using feedback and instant feedback in the vehicle. And they've also found that hard acceleration events have decreased by 86% by providing drivers with an instant uh, feedback. So now it's, it's really fantastic that Azuga has this kind of data that shows their technology is effective to driver, uh, to driver behavior, reducing driver behavior, and also that it's based on real world data. Um, but typically, a lot of the companies we talk to um, claim that their systems are very effective uh, and they don't provide the data to back it up. Uh, so as consumers of these technologies, it's really critical that we have access to independent evaluations regarding the effectiveness so that we're not just relying on a company saying that, yeah, you know, of course our, our technology is going to help you improve. Um, it's important for us to have independent third-party evaluations to tell us um, unbiasedly if the systems are actually improving safety. So the researchers here at Virginia Tech Transportation Institute completed a project that was funded by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to actually do one of these third-party assessments of a driver monitoring system. So the system we evaluated in this project was actually an in-vehicle video-based system um, that also incorporated back office performance management meeting. software and also in-depth driver coaching. So we installed this, this technology in two heavy vehicle fleets that were very different in, in structure and in operation. Uh, we had 100 drivers participate in the program for 17 weeks. Uh, the technology we used had two cameras, one facing the forward roadway and one facing back at the driver. And it also included a three-axis accelerometer uh, that tracked you know, hard braking, um, acceleration and cornering, and speeding events um, anytime the truck was on. And it also had an in-vehicle feedback the light that up. provided feedback to the Turn driver any time a potentially unsafe event was, was recorded. So what did we find? Uh, so for carrier A, the first carrier, we found that the safety intervention worked. So what we did was during the first four weeks of the program, we just observed how the drivers were driving without any type of intervention. And then starting at week five, we started uh, the managers coaching the drivers based on the, the monitoring system data. And what we found was that with the system, we saw a 38% reduction of safety-related events. So this is really good. And also, what you can see from the graph on the left here is that from week five to week 17, there was a pretty strong decreasing trend of safety-related events. Until week 17, you can see there were very, very, very few safety-related events. So this is really good. This is what we want to see when we're using driver monitoring systems. 
has left the meeting. We want to see if the monitoring systems were effective. We really wanted to understand why they were being effective. Was it the system itself that was improving behavior, or, or what was the impact of coaching in association with the reduction in risky driving? So what we did was we compared the risky driving from, from the drivers who got coaching and compared it to the risky driving behaviors of drivers who didn't receive coaching. And what we found here on the right, the right two uh, bars in this graph, showed that only those drivers who receive coaching reduced their number of severe safety-related events. So this, this tells us that it wasn't the technology, it wasn't the video inside the vehicle, it was actually the coaching that was reducing the risky driving behaviors. <clears throat> this graph on the left or on the right also shows us something else that's really interesting. The managers, by using the onboard safety monitoring system uh, technology and data, they were able to focus their energies and their, their coaching efforts only on those drivers who were in most need. So you can see that the drivers who who got the coaching were very risky before they received the coaching. In comparison to the drivers who didn't receive the coaching, uh, the, this really um, shows the impact and, and advantage of using a monitoring system to help the, the managers put their effort into the drivers who actually need the coaching. So here are the results for the second carrier. Once again, just when we're looking at the raw data here, you can see that there was a significant decrease between before the coaching and after the coaching. Uh, however, this graph is actually quite misleading when we dug into the actual data for carrier B. And when we go through the next two slides, hopefully you'll see why I, I think that this is a misleading graph. Jeff Madrid has joined the meeting. All right, so, so in addition to just looking at, at the, um, the driving data, we also did a brief questionnaire with the managers from the, or from the drivers and managers from both fleets. So we asked them if they reviewed video during the coaching session. Did they identify the cause of the safety-related event? Did they identify if there are future or ways to prevent future events from occurring? We asked them if the coaching was positive or negative. Um, we asked them if they were going to use the information from the coaching session to prevent future events. And we also asked them about the length of coaching and if there were any acts of sabotage. Sabotage in this was a driver actually covering up the video so we weren't getting reliable data from the system. And what you can see is a very stark difference in how the drivers from carrier A responded versus the drivers from carrier B. At carrier A, uh, in the coaching session, they reviewed the video. They identified the root cause. They identified ways to prevent future events. The coaching was positive. Um, they were gonna use the information. And the coaching sessions were, were a good length, 10 minutes, and there were only four acts of sabotage. In comparison to carrier B, almost completely different. They didn't use the video. They didn't identify the root cause. They didn't identify ways to prevent it from happening again. The coaching session was negative, and they weren't going to use the information. But really what's most important is this last line down here. A carrier B, there's 278 instances of drivers covering up the video cameras so that we couldn't get their driving data. And this all occurred during that intervention phase. So if we go back to this graph here, if we had had those 278 instances of drivers and video most likely, we wouldn't have seen any reduction here in safety-related events. In fact, it's quite possible that their dry, risky driving behaviors even could have gotten worse. Uh, so this is the reason why we, we are pretty sure that that reduction we saw at Carrier B was not true at all. <clears throat> so, so what led to the success of Carrier A versus the failure of Carrier B? One of the main things is the safety manager. So carrier A had a trusted safety manager that had a really good rapport with all the drivers. Um, the drivers told us when we were interviewing them that they believed the manager had their best interests in mind when they were implementing the program and they trusted his opinion. Um, this was really the opposite of carrier B. So carrier B's manager was new, which isn't a bad thing, um, but those drivers didn't trust the, this manager's opinion at all. Um, they didn't know really why he was doing this. Um, so they, they were skeptical. Carrier A also had a really good rollout of the program before the coaching began to take place. Uh, so they had a kickoff meeting. It was attended voluntarily by all the drivers that were gonna participate in the program. And the drivers said that 
and told us that, you know, our manager thinks this is a good idea, so let's just give it a try. Let's see what happens. Let's see if we can become better. So they bought into the program just because of how it was introduced to them and that they trusted their manager's opinion. This is in complete opposite uh, agreement from Carrier B. So Carrier B also had a kickoff. Um, it was so poorly attended that we, the researchers, had to go out there to try to introduce the program to them. And when we got out there to their site, we realized there were all these negative opinions and perceptions of what this program was. So right away, before the program even started, the drivers at Carrier B thought that the whole purpose of this video program was only to punish them, only to find fault in their driving, which is the complete opposite of what it was. The whole purpose of the program is for fact-finding. Um, the purpose Nancy is for coaching and helping them become better, and it wasn't going to be used for punishment at all. Um, so, so we had to go in and convince the drivers that, no, it's, it's not going to be for fault-finding, uh, and, and we're only going to be using it to help you become better. And then finally at Carrier Aid, the manager was committed to the program. The manager did what they were supposed to do in the coaching session. They reviewed the video, they um, were, remained positive, and they helped drivers figure out ways to become better. In comparison to, to Carrier B, that manager didn't follow the protocol. They didn't review video. They were negative, And they didn't address any acts of sabotage throughout the entire program. So what does this all mean? Really, it, it tells us that there's a need for this back office approach uh, to be created to support the implementation of monitoring programs. So it's not just a technology. We really need to develop a culture and get the managers and the drivers to buy into the program before implementing uh, a monitoring system. So during the course of all of our research, uh, we've discussed implementation with, with many different fleets. And many fleets actually have a false belief that they can just simply install this type of technology in their truck and expect immediate improvements. So unfortunately for them, this almost never happens, and their expectations, therefore, are usually never met. Um, there are a few steps that we have found through research and by talking to fleets that are um, connected to pretty successful implementation of monitoring programs. So what are the five keys? Number one is getting drivers to buy in to the program, using the right measures and KPIs when you're evaluating and developing the program, uh, also developing good program awareness before implementing the technology, uh, using good um, driver training and coaching practices, and then finally doing a, a proper and good continuous evaluation of the program. So now we'll go through each of these five steps in more detail. So the driver, as we saw looking at carrier A versus carrier B, driver monitoring programs are really unlikely to result in sustained behavior change when they're implemented in absence of a supportive safety culture. So safety culture is kind of a fuzzy term, uh, but really it's best described as, quote, just the way we do things around here. Um, so. It, Really one of the best ways to develop a strong safety culture is by getting managers to buy in and, and drivers to buy in to a program and to build the trust of the drivers. Um, so if we remember just the reactions of the drivers at Carrier A, they trusted their manager when he introduced the idea. They said, you know, he thinks this is a good idea, no, so, so we're going to give it a try. The meeting. So how can you develop driver buy-in? So first, as I just mentioned, managers also must buy into the program. So management not only needs to attend safety meetings, talk about safety in normal conversations, meet with drivers um, either individually or in a group to talk about safety, but they also have to walk that talk. So not only do they have to talk about safety, but they have to show that they are committed to being safe themselves. So just for an example, we were doing some some consulting work with a fleet previously, and we were trying to increase their driver's seatbelt usage. Uh, the, the drivers weren't buckling up, and the managers, you know, wanted to increase the seatbelt use because that's one of the best ways to help reduce injuries and fatalities in the event of a crash. And, and we were failing. We were trying a lot of interventions, and we weren't getting drivers to buckle up. So we started talking to them, asking for their opinion, and what the drivers told us was that uh, just go out and look in the, in the parking lot at the beginning of the day. So we did, and what we saw was that the manager every day, even though the manager was saying to buckle up, it's really important, the manager was coming to work every single day and leaving work every single day without buckling up. 
So the drivers knew this. The drivers knew that this manager actually wasn't committed to buckling their seatbelts. And the drivers were just following through. They were doing what the management did. <clears throat> so uh, another way to really start a strong safety culture is to build trust uh, from the drivers. So it's really important to get drivers involved in the development of a safety program. Ask for their feedback over the course. How can we get better? What's, what are your concerns about this monitoring program? And as managers, we need to actively listen to that feedback. So actively listening means you know, paying attention to what they say, but actually doing something about it. So a lot of drivers think they will just provide feedback and nothing ever happens. Um, the way to build trust is actually showing the drivers that you do value their feedback by doing something about it, addressing it, and, and making it shown that, that you can help them and to make the program better. Uh, another way is provide drivers with choice in the program, whether it's uh, how the how the program is implemented, um, what types of rewards may be offered. And by doing this and providing drivers opportunities for choice, we're actually getting them to buy into the program, and also they'll be more likely to take ownership in the program. And what we know from research is that when drivers believe they own a part of a program, they're much more likely to uh, be actively involved in that program and to take it seriously. Another important thing is to not expect immediate results. So changing a culture is really difficult. It takes a long time. And changing drivers' behavior is also equally as challenging because it's ingrained in their nature. So we can't expect immediate results um, or else we're going to fail. We're going to think we failed instead of looking at a longer, a longer time frame, a month, two months, or three months even. And then finally, we need to demonstrate that safety is of value. Values don't typically change over time. Priorities, on the other hand, can change over time. So if a, if a deadline comes up that has to be met, some of our priorities may be shifted to meet that deadline. We never want safety to be shifted. We always want our drivers to be safe, and we need the drivers to understand that just because we have a tight deadline, we don't want them to drive fatigued, for instance. If they're tired, we, we want them to, to take a break. We want them to be safe on the roadway. And then finally, it's a good idea to create a program leadership committee with drivers involved. So this leadership committee will help steer the direction of the program, create the policies and roles and responsibilities. And by having the drivers involved in that committee, they're going to be they're going to own the program. It's also really important to use the right measures to help tell if a program is working. So when you're trying to figure out what KPIs to use for a program, you should ask yourself the following questions. Um, you know, what, what do I need to know for my program to be working? How can I use the program to develop accountability? Uh, what do I need to know in order to recognize good drivers? What behaviors do I need to track uh, to let me know what drivers are risky? And then also, what data do I need to know so that I can effectively coach my drivers? So really there are two types of measures, uh, process measures and outcome measures. And if we think back to that graph with the iceberg, the trailing versus leading indicators, this is the same thing. So, so process measures are those leading indicators. They focus on the behavior of the driver. Um, and these are really good types of measures for when we provide feedback uh, individually or in a group setting. So when we're developing those driver scores, we want to use those leading indicators or the process measures. So just as an example of a process measure, uh, the number of hard brakes that a driver has, uh, what percentage of the time do they speed, or how many alerts do they get a week? And then in comparison to that, the outcome measures, these are those trailing, uh, trailing indicators. And they're not so good for providing individual feedback uh, for drivers, but they're really good for evaluating the overall success of a program. And this is because they don't necessarily focus on the individual behavior that a driver can control, um, but it's more the result of multiple behaviors. Uh, so just for example, an outcome measure could be the number of preventable crashes you have, how many crash-free miles you have, or how many injuries as a result of a crash have you had in a given week or month or a year. Can somebody from Azuga change the slide, please?
All right, so the third key to success when you're implementing a program is to develop awareness of the program up front before the drivers have a chance to guess what it will include. So if you remember back to drivers at Carrier B, uh, they weren't aware of what the program was actually being used for, and they developed this negative perception right away. So we really want to avoid that. So when we're developing the awareness, we want to be upfront on why we're implementing the driver program. And really the reason why you're implementing these is to keep your drivers safe. You want them to return back to you the next day, return home to their families um, at the end of the day. Uh, so we need them to understand that the reason is not just to punish them or to catch them doing something wrong. We also need to let the drivers be fully aware what the functionality of the system is, what are their roles and responsibilities in the program, and then also what the rewards are for being a good driver and how they can earn those rewards themselves. And then when we're developing the awareness, we need to take into consideration how this information is going to be distributed. Uh, so in a lot of fleets, drivers have different shifts. So if we just held one meeting, we may be missing out the drivers who work the night shift, for example. So typically we can distribute information in, in newsletters or bulletins or emails or company-wide safety meetings. Uh, but we also need to consider the various reading levels or language persistence has left of, the, meeting. Uh, the various drivers in our fleet. So as we talked about previously, effective driver coaching is really critical to the success of, of driver monitoring programs. So the purpose, if you remember, isn't to catch the drivers doing something wrong or incorrect. The purpose is to help them be safe and not get hurt. Uh, so to make sure drivers perceive the coaching tool or process as effective and positive, uh, we need to, you know, not focus on the punishment, allow drivers um, – to be actively engaged and provide feedback. Uh, we need to help identify ways for them to improve their performance with the monitoring system. Um, we need to also help them set goals. So we know that the drivers, when they set their Can own goals, the they're gonna be more motivated to help achieve those goals. And then finally, almost the most important thing is the program evaluation. A lot of fleets will just implement something and, and not really do a great job of the evaluation of that program. So without the evaluation, it's really impossible to know if your program is working or not. Uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the program should be completed really on a regular basis by continuously collecting that data, regularly communicating and getting feedback from drivers um, pretty much continuously. So additionally, the evaluation should uh, should occur anytime there are any changes in your in your fleet, whether they're operational changes or anytime the data may suggest safety is necessarily not improving as you expected, or anytime you add new technologies to the fleet or ask your drivers to do new things. Um, so while you're evaluating the effectiveness of the program, it's important to examine uh, it, if the procedures for coaching or data collection and driver coaching are working. It's also important to see if the new risky driving behavior trends are starting. And you can also look to see if your safety scores um, compare now after the intervention to what you were expecting them to be. So just to summarize, um, to improve your fleet safety, it's really critical to reduce the risky driving behaviors. Remember, close to 90% of all crashes are the result of an error by the driver. So we must first find ways to identify improved driving in order to help reduce those crashes. So one of the ways is with driver monitoring systems. And then the scientific research has shown that these programs are actually really effective at improving safety. But it's not just the technology that's improving safety. We have to put the time in to develop the culture of your fleet and use behavioral strategies to help drivers become safer when they're on the road. Uh, so we need to be careful when we're developing the program. Um, and we also need to understand that it takes time and effort. Uh, it can take a month. It may take two months. It may take three months for you to start seeing the, the rewards from all that upfront effort at improving your, your safety culture. It's also important to know that drivers may initially resist this type of program. A lot of drivers typically resist this big brother, um, but when we take the initiative to get them on board and get them to buy into the program upfront, 
um, that resistance goes away really quickly. And also, if we can get drivers to buy in and start championing the idea of, you know, this program is really just to help us be safe, where it's not going to be used for punishment, the resistance really drops away pretty quickly. And then finally, it's really important to maintain the communication about the program and to get drivers uh, to get their feedback, see what's happening and what's working well and what's not working too well, and then take steps to address that feedback to show that, you know, you do care about their opinions. Uh, thanks, Matt. That was really informative. Um, uh, we're really sorry. It looks like we're facing a glitch that's announcing the entry and exits, uh, but we are Has working the in the background to have it fixed. All right, and uh, now I'm going to hand it over to John, but before I do, uh, Mr. Sims is currently the fleet manager for Satellites Unlimited, and they are the regional service provider for DISH Network that covers territory within about seven states of the southeast region of the United States. Uh, they currently have a fleet size of around 450 vehicles, but besides his busy schedule of managing a fleet of 450, uh, John actually enjoys fishing, cooking, and loves playing video games whenever time allows. He is a big fan of college and pro football. Uh, now, John is going to share his actual experience combining uh, driver monitoring with behavioral techniques to address safety. Over to you, John. Okay. Um, well, Azuga uh, has helped us uh, reduce vehicle incidents, as you can see, by quarter one of uh, 2015, we were at 20. Um, quarter one of 2016 at 14, 2017 at 10, and this year so far at seven. Um, they have been a big key, I think, because of the buzzer impact um, that they ha that we have on each of the devices. Um, our drivers seem to be more aware. They've actually came to me and told me that um, the buzzers make them more aware and it has affected the, the driving score of most of our employees. Um, the good thing of, about that is, you know, it cuts down on the hard breakings or it makes you, it makes you realize when you're hard breaking. Um, and that seems to be where a lot of our incidents have occurred. Um, and as far as allowing customer the custom alerts that uh, Azuga offers has been a great tool for us as well. Um, you know, we can set up uh, the Today's different speed off. has left the meeting. We can set up different speeding alerts to be whether it's five miles an hour over the posted speed limit, you know, or or whatever you want it to be. Um, the device buzzer impact has also helped with uh most of our vans have governors on it sure. so we go usually has at left the meeting. miles an hour but we have it sit for the ones that don't uh to go off if a driver reaches 80 miles an hour to uh to bounce off of some of the things that matt said he uh he's correct with some of that research um i mean getting driver buy-in is one of the main things has joined the meeting uh, when we implemented it took you know we told the guys hey we know this is something new it's going to be it's going to take a while for y'all to get used to it don't look at this as any kind of punishment um we're not going to come down on you hard for anything we're just going to bring this to your attention when it happens for the first month month and a half um but um, it seems to have worked for us along with our safety department's help of uh, implementing the Smith driving system as well. Uh, that's, that's great, John. I really wish this was the case with every fleet out there. Um, so it looks like we can start with the Q&A session now. Okay, wow, we have a lot of questions already. Justin um, has left the meeting. 
Okay, looks like we have a question from Kevin. Uh, Matt, this is for you. Do you have any insight into the type of fleets that participated in this study? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so as I mentioned, they were both heavy vehicle fleets. Um, one was an over-the-road fleet, so so this was a, a fleet where the drivers basically traveled across the whole country. Um, they would come back to their terminal once a week, uh, depending on, on their schedule. It could be on the weekend. It could be on a, um, a weekday. The other fleet was an out-and-back operation. So, so this fleet, the drivers had dedicated routes, and basically they just worked um, between 10 to 12 hours. They left one terminal and came back to that same terminal every single day. Okay, so we have another one from Lindsay. Um, what are some of the key performance indicators fleet managers should be measuring when it comes to monitoring driver behavior? Yeah, so so I think that, as I mentioned, it's really important to look at both the leading and trailing indicators. Um, but for a technology kind of like a Zuga, I think specifically the number of hard braking is very important. And, and John kind of mentioned that too. A lot of fleets can see there's a strong relationship between um, hard braking events and incidences, whether they're severe crashes or very minor crashes. Um, I think another really important one is speeding. As we know from research, speeding is definitely associated with um, with increased severity of crashes. So, so we want our drivers to um, maintain a safe speed and, and not have a lot of um, over speed limit incidences. Okay. Um, there's another one from Keith. He says that he feels like he has a solid rapport with his drivers, yet he feels uh, will be skeptical and maybe put up a fight when it comes to tracking their driving behavior, habits. Uh, do you have any additional tips on how to overcome these objections without ruffling too many feathers? Yeah, I'll go first, and then I think John can provide a lot of valuable insight into this as well. Um, but the buy-in is absolutely critical to, to getting drivers to reduce that, that resistance. The resistance is, honestly, I, I think it's just natural. Um, drivers are going to naturally – kind of be hesitant uh, when we start introducing this type of technology. But we get them to buy and we help them, we get them to be involved in the, the development of the program and how it's going to be implemented and and um, assure them that, you know, this is really being used to help them to be safer and, and not going to be used, at least initially, for any type of punishment. Um, that really has been shown, and a lot of fleets have told us that really has been helpful. Um, so, John, do you have anything to add to that? I, I totally agree with is, with Matt. Is punishment is really out of the question to start out with. Um, you know, making the guys believe that you want them to come home the same way they left, which, you know, in my opinion, I want everybody to do that. And especially at work, and how their performance can affect the whole company. Um, if you can get a buy-in from one or two senior guys that you may have a good rapport with already, and, I mean, if you, if you think they will buy in from the get-go, it may help to get them push the idea. Yeah. That, that helped with us here. Yeah, that's a good point, John. Um, one thing James that we've Ferguson. consistently shown is that if you can just get and identify a couple drivers who are well-respected in the fleet, and those drivers already know the importance of safety, if we can get them to buy into that program, those individuals serve as champions, and they are much better at getting their peers and, and other drivers to come in and listen to the program and buy into it as well. So I, I do think that's a really valuable point you just made. Thank you. Okay, guys. Um, Elliot wants to know uh, who should be involved in a safety leadership committee? So I, I think the number one type of individual that you want on the committee is who's being impacted. So in this case, it's the drivers. You absolutely want to have the drivers 
involved in the committee. You want you want their voices to be heard. Not only is that going to help ease their resistance, but it's also going to increase the ownership. But um, in, in programs like this, it, it's really, in my opinion, everyone. You want managers to be involved in this committee. You want the drivers. If you have dispatchers in in a heavy vehicle fleet, you want them involved. Uh, so it's really, you know, anyone the program touches, you would like to have that role involved in, in a committee. Great. Um, Tina wants Don't to know, is there, a safety, left the meeting. Right. is there a safety benchmark to measure or compare? So, not readily available from from my knowledge. Uh, if we're looking at um, at crashes, for instance, you can you can look and try to get an idea in the national estimate for fleets of, of your similar size and vehicle makeup. The best way to do is to implement a technology like this for a month or two to get some baseline data. We call it baseline data, um, basically to tell you exactly what's meeting. happening before implementing a program. That's going to kind of give you the best idea of, of where you are regarding your, your risky driving behaviors. Um, John, do you have any input on, on that? Uh, I pretty much uh, agree with you on that. I, I mean, it's kind of hard to base it off anything Mike without I've left off the meeting. how the drivers are driving. Because yeah. most of the time when you implement something to begin with, you're going to have a few drivers out there that, and, you, and if you tell them there's yeah, this, has left the meeting. But drivers out there that are going to drive safer because of it, but most of them are going to drive the same as they were beforehand if they hear no discipline. So you can take that to start out with over, like Matt said, maybe a month, maybe two months, and then go from there going forward, you know, trying to make adjustments to change their driving habits. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, we have another question. So do you think it's, it's a good idea to implement gamification among the drivers? Yeah, so I think gamification is a really, can be a really good idea. It has to be implemented pretty well. Um, one, one of the major benefits is that drivers get involved in it and they get excited about it. And most of the time with gamification, there has to be some sort of reward um, that can be achieved. So, so by having that reward, it's driving the participation, it's driving, um, getting people involved in it, and it's helping drivers try to be better. Um, you do have to kind of be careful with gamification because you don't want drivers starting to um, try to sabotage their competitors. We have seen that in, in the past in some fleets. Um, we don't want drivers taking shortcuts, right? So if a driver can take a shortcut to, to try to make it look like they're safer, but that shortcut is un, an unsafe act, for instance. Uh, so for example, um, some, some gamification systems are, are based on getting to certain deliveries on time. Well, that's all well and good, but if they're speeding to get there, that's bad. Uh, so you do have to be careful when you're implementing the gamification to make sure that drivers are, are not being unsafe to try to earn their reward. All right, and uh, how, do you, how do we get started on that? That was another question from, sorry, that was another question from Lucy. Uh, to clarify, to get started on the gamification? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, that's fine too. Yeah, so, there's, a, there's a couple ways on that. Um, I know that several technology providers do include gamification. Um, Azuka is one of those technology providers that has an app, for, for instance, the drivers can go on and it helps track their scores and has a gamification and has rewards associated uh, with the top earners or, or the safest drivers. Um, another way to do it is you can do set up a gamification internally so you can provide and track driver scores and driver safety over time and set up a, um, a reinforcement schedule or a reward schedule. Maybe it's once a month for the, the driver with 
the best safety record, for instance, can earn a um, a sweet T-shirt or a um, fifty dollar gift certificate or something like that. All right, great. So I see a lot of questions out there, but we're kind of short on time. But don't worry, we will follow up with an answer separately. Uh, plus. We will be sending the recording of this webinar in an email, so please feel free to forward it to your friends and colleagues and share it in social media with hashtag AzugaGPS, that is A-Z-U-G-A G-P-S. Oh yes, like we promised, we will announce the lucky coupon winners shortly. You will receive an email with the details. Uh, also, just want to let you know, we just wrote an article today about the Satellite's Unlimited Success Story under our blog section. It has a lot of data insights, so I'd really recommend everyone to check it out. Uh, you can find it on www.azuga.com under the blog section. Um, if you'd like to know more about Azuga, you will be redirected to our demo page after you exit the webinar, and there is a form to reach us. Uh, other than that, if you have any feedback or questions, please feel free to reach us at info at azuga.com. Once again, thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to Matt and John. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on another Azuga webinar. Have a blessed day.